Well, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to come and talk to uh, this institute in, in particular because I have a kind of familial sense of connection to this institute. Uh, my, uh, my father, uh, I come from a DFO family, don't hold that against me. Uh, and uh, my father was a marine biologist, uh, a uh, clam and oyster guy. And uh, I grew up right next to, I almost called you Carrie, right next to Murdoch. Uh, Murdoch's quite a bit younger than I am, so don't worry. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Murdoch's father was uh, one of my father's summer students. I mean, this is how uh, interconnected. And my father played golf every Saturday with Bill Ricker. Those of you who know, uh, I'm sure some of you know that name. Uh, so yeah, I have a, a connection to, uh, to you and, and your work and the importance of your work. So I really appreciated it when can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I really appreciated it when uh, Rashid, of course, you know, he's the ultimate connector. And uh, so it's fantastic having that connection between IOF and what is, was the Liu Institute connection and is now the, the policy school. So I'm, uh, I'm privileged to be uh, the first director, but only a pro tem director. Um, I'm happy to kind of get the school on its feet and then uh, pass it on to uh, a permanent director uh, in a year and a half or so after we do the search. Uh, so the, the, it's a UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and we've had quite, quite a bit of discussion about do we call it the policy school, it's a bit of a mouthful, right? Uh, or do we call it SPPGA? And so the decision, I think, is uh, is actually to use the acronym. And the reason being is that there are some people in the school who relate more to the global affairs part of the title than they might relate to the policy part of the title. So trying to be in inclusive. Um, although I, I have to admit to being kind of not a fan of, of acronyms. But anyway, so whenever I can, I do say the UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And so what our intention really is, is to, to make change in the policy landscape uh, and to explore local and global issues and to find solutions. So we know that as university folks, we need to publish in journals, uh, but we also need to mobilize knowledge. We also need to provide evidence-informed uh, policy assistance as much as we can. So it's, it's a challenge for a new school um, for us to position ourselves slightly differently than some of the historically been around for a long time uh, policy schools and, um, and programs. So there are some founding partners, the Institute of Asian Research, uh, the Liu Institute for Global Issues, um, there are partners that have joined us, uh, so there's um, a Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, which was in political science, and what it does, it uh, has a, a variety of interesting programs, but one of them is an Institute for Future Legislators. It's a summer institute, so if any of you, and I hope you do, have political aspirations, this is an opportunity to actually learn some basics around, you know, what do you need to know if you are thinking of running locally, provincially, nationally. So it's an interesting center. We also are the home of something called the Canadian International Resources and Development Institute, uh, which was originally at our mining school at Keevil, and is repositioning itself really to go well beyond uh, looking at resource governance in the extractive industries, but also generally in more across resource development. We are at CERTI, the only way we can work is if a country and an emerging country has to be on Global Affairs Canada's list, requests our assistance. So it's very much coming from the country 
We have projects in Mongolia, in West Africa, and in the Andean countries. And we're starting to begin to focus on the huge challenges around artisanal and small-scale mining, which when I started to learn about CERTI, I, I didn't realize it's so profound across the globe and so challenging from a health perspective and from an environmental perspective. So it's a, it's a very interesting group uh, and one that uh, we need to uh, find more faculty members and students who are interested in working in these important areas. We have, I'll talk more about the Masters of Public Policy and Global Affairs. We also <clears throat> are kind of the administrative home uh, to some of the arts undergrad programs. So uh, international relations, uh, very interesting major. Uh, I think there's a minor and a major. There's around 300 students in it in third and fourth year. Uh, we have a Latin American studies group and an African studies uh, group. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite eclectic. Uh, <clears throat> and so really wanting to be this interdisciplinary hub that's going to draw on, hopefully, people from IOF, uh, from people from all across, uh, all across the campus, starting uh, small, but uh, gradually growing. We had a bit of a launch <clears throat> in September, and it was very interesting to hear from, in this case, we heard from Tim Sargent, uh, Tim is, uh, uh, the federal government has a system where they assign deputy champions to universities. So it, he's our deputy champion in, uh, in Ottawa. And currently he's the deputy minister of uh, international trade. So he's deep in NAFTA. He's deep in all these sticky, challenging uh, uh, policy issues. So he talked... Uh, John MacArthur is from the Brookings Institute, uh, also a fascinating uh, person globally who does policy work. And then we had Kim Baird, who's the former uh, uh, chief of the uh, Sawasan uh, band, who did a lot of uh, quite uh, innovative work uh, when, when she was uh, chief. And so we, we asked them, so, you know, what does the policy school of the future look like? Uh, you know, how, do, how should we re research, how should we teach, how should we act? So lots of, of interesting ideas around making sure that, and in a, I would encapsulate it, one of our metrics should be how many policies did we actually influence and help implement? And I like that metric. It gives us... Not only do we need to do um, academic publishing, we also need to mobilize our knowledge as best uh, we can. <clears throat> so the master's program, and I brought along some brochures. I'm sure none of you are interested in doing yet another degree, but you might have brothers, sisters, cousins who might be interested in the program. So I'll leave those there. So it's a 20-month full-time professional graduate program. So it, the concept is that you're work-ready as much as possible when you leave the program. It isn't preparing you for a PhD. Uh, it's preparing you to go into uh, some kind of employment. And it's trying to uh, build on people's existing work experience. So it's a little bit like an MBA in the sense that you were looking for people who already have two to five years of work experience and they're thinking, you know, I'd really like to move into a policy area or I'd like to change my career path a little bit. And so we attempt to leverage our interdisciplinary faculty members who come from the Liu Institute, from the Institute of Asian Research, and from the Institute of Resources, Environment, and Sustainability, your neighbors, right up on the fourth floor, who have been uh, really important partners in actually building the, the program. 
We've tried to position the program with UBC's strengths in mind. So not many universities are positioned the way we are on the Pacific Rim with the kind of Asia expertise we have, uh, and, and then obviously our uh, sustainability ex expertise across the... So there's certainly an emphasis on policy analysis. I'm a designer, and so I try to bring in uh, a strategic design frame and toolkit so that the students have a, uh, a really diverse set of skills. We offer three stream options, uh, development and social change, uh, resources, energy and sustainability, and global governance and security. That's sort of the place where we're starting. Uh, however, you could see as the school grows and as the program goes, we grows, we may add in, like health is an obvious, uh, obvious one, uh, and there may well be uh, other, uh, other kinds of, of streams that we might think of. So I told Rashid that he was featured in the, uh, the presentation. Uh, we were fortunate to uh, have the opportunity to hire one of the president's research excellence chairs. We chose development policy partly because we felt there was a bit of a gap on the campus around people who are looking at new ways of thinking about development because uh, I think all of us would probably agree that a lot of our international aid programs haven't been particularly as successful as we might want them to be. So what's a new approach? How, what kind of research and academic viewpoint can we bring to, uh, to development policy? And so uh, Rashid is our poster person for, for that particular ad. Uh, we're also starting to build some research clusters and this is where uh, I'm hoping that uh, as we reach out to different parts of campus that some of you might be interested in connecting to people who are interested in policy issues in these particular topics. And so they're in their early stages of inception. Uh, we're starting to figure out, you know, what's the right label? Uh, we, of course, we have uh, Rashid on the ocean side. We also have a, a brand new faculty member. Uh, she's joint uh, with the Kiva Mining School. Her focus is water, and water both in the regional sense of how mining operations affect water and in the mine sense uh, itself. Uh, her name is Nadia Kunst, uh, and so we've got people who are interested across, uh, across the board. Uh, in terms of security and conflict, Erin Baines is one of our faculty members. She works in transitional justice and in post-conflict situations, often in uh, places like Uganda. Uh, so challenging work uh, that uh, we think is very important. And then just a, a comment on science and technology governance. So one of, a lot of our people, like Rashid, have joint appointments. So it's a very diverse group of people. Uh, Taylor Owen has a joint appointment between the Policy School and the School of Journalism. He's very interested in uh, artificial intelligence from the point of view of policy and governance. Because right now, government is investing a ton of money into computer science departments around artificial intelligence and investing nothing into how are we going to manage the regulatory, the context of these huge changes that business is picking up and uh, we don't really know where it's going to go. And similarly, I'm very interested in genomics. I'm the chair of Genome Canada and I worry that similarly the gene editing uh, potential and opportunities are going to falter on the shoals of not having a good policy context, a good regulatory context. So I think that's one of the more uh, compelling uh, research areas right now. And so we're, we're actually just in the beginnings 
of looking at um, the digital threats around democracy and around our election systems. So we really want the school to be a place where we actually uh, act quickly to help government or whoever wants the help to find policy solutions quicker than we can do it through an NSERC or a SHRC grant or any of our usual academic channels, which are just take too long. By then, the election is going to have happened. So we need to be able to be nimble and act quickly. Uh, teaching in the Masters of Public Policy and Global Affairs program, uh, we have something called the Global Policy Project, which is a six credit, uh, almost like a capstone where students actually uh, travel and have a global client that they work with. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Could be part of one of the emerging research clusters. Uh, we have, it would be, I think, really interesting to do, we have this policy at UBC series. It could be something that we could do together with IOF. Uh, getting involved in policy and knowledge mobilization generally. So there's a, a really um, exciting opportunity right now around UBC getting its act together around knowledge mobilization. We've never supported students or faculty members in helping uh, achieve more than, you know, you're the deputy minister, here's my A journal paper, good luck. So how do we bridge that, uh, that kind of gap? Uh, becoming a School of Public Policy and Global Affairs affiliate, and then engaging with something that um, I call the Policy Studio, which I also have a few uh, cards around. So just to quickly go through those uh, opportunities. So this was the lineup for policy at UBC uh, this past fall. So uh, we tend to uh, to look at different kinds of partners. This one was a lot of partnership with CERTI. Uh, but you'll notice this one. We have uh, a brand new chair in disarmament, global, and human security. And when we started that chair process, maybe two years ago, I kind of thought, oh, that's interesting. And now I'm thinking, thank heavens he's here. Because, you know, the, the, the challenges around uh, the nuclear uh, fear uh, and uh, context are huge. So Ramana um, is interested in uh, all of those things. So you can tell that this is quite a diverse and uh, active community. So the, this is what we call it GP Squared, the Global Policy Project. Uh, this was the first year we did it, uh, so in teams of five. Uh, I believe really strongly that when you get into the workplace, you never work by yourself. Very rare to sort of say, here I am doing my work. Generally, you're, in, you're part of a team, you're working in some way or another. So I, especially in policy, I feel like students need that experience. They need to learn how to work well in in a collaborative sense. So we had a number of projects, um, always a, a client. Uh, the middle one was uh, a client by the name of Basics. It's, um, it's an NGO kind of umbrella that has a lot of different uh, organizations under it. In this case, the students arrived in it. So we always do field work, so actually I think this group is leaving next week to do their field work. Uh, these folks went to India for, it was two and a half weeks. Uh, they arrived on the day that Prime Minister Modi demonetized. So they were kind of there for uh, a huge policy shift. They were going to the uh, states that are in the northeast of India uh, and working on financial inclusion and trying to figure out how do small landowners in the agricultural sense you know, work uh, in terms of finance. Then we had a, a group who went to Indonesia. Uh, the Tropical Landscape Financial Facility, interestingly enough, there was two finance ones. I, I don't know exactly why that happened. Uh, <clears throat> and so they were looking at 
the problem that exists all over, but in particular in Indonesia, of small and large landowners burning agriculture crops and uh, forest crops, creating a huge haze problem, which is an environmental problem and a health problem. So they were working on some potential policy solutions. And then finally I thought, oh boy, if you're a single parent, you're not going to go gallivanting off to India for two weeks. So this group actually had Global Affairs Canada and one of the Sustainable Development Goals as a focus, uh, the one on accessible uh, access to good water for indigenous vulnerable communities. So they worked on a monitoring tool. So some of these are extremely practical. So Global Affairs Canada said, look, we've got all these people reviewing projects who know nothing about water. So how can you help them do a better job of doing an initial review of a project uh, from a, that kind of point of view? Talk for a minute about the policy studio. So first of all, an opportunity came, uh, as I was saying, UBC is going to pay much more attention to knowledge mobilization. And out of that, we're actually creating something called Innovation at UBC, which will include our University Industry Liaison Office, our entre Entrepreneurship at UBC Office, our Business Development, and a Knowledge Mobilization Hub. So we interviewed uh, what we, the Royal We, one of my PhD students, interviewed a number of uh, UBC professors who already mobilize their knowledge in the policy realm. So Rashid was, uh, was interviewed, as were uh, a number of others, to gain some knowledge about how are they doing that? And are they mobilizing to government or to industry or to NGOs? And if so, what mechanisms are they using? And now we're actually in the co-creating knowledge mobilization and proposing uh, to have funded in the next budget cycle the beginnings of a knowledge mobilization hub and spoke model. So it, it, you know, we can't have just centralized things at UBC. It's, there's too much cultural diversity, which is good. Uh, and so it's been a really interesting project to utilize the skill set and the approach of the policy studio, which is really about convening. I don't think we utilize our neutrality as a university to convene groups who have to tackle policy issues. So if we convene government, business, NGO, civil society, it's a much more comfortable position. If any of you have ever been to government consultations, there's always a bit of an edge to them. And partly because I don't think they follow the best practice in terms of involving stakeholders right from the beginning in terms of actually identifying problems. We're also involved in something called the Resilient City uh, Policy Challenge. And this was a little bit of money that came from a kind of unusual source, the, the French ambassador to Canada, who said, I want more student exchange between France and Canada. And so we invited, I think it was seven uh, policy students from Sciences Po in Paris, who came last April to join eight of our students, to take on basically a 25-hour challenge around how might we improve social connectedness. So we had a team around seniors, a team on refugees, and a team on youth. And so out of this, and it's, it's actually remarkable to me sometimes how quickly we can generate some really interesting ideas, and then generally we do nothing with them. You know, okay, great, student project, tip. So I don't want that to happen, so I'm taking a group of our second year students starting in January. We're going to start where these folks left off and see if we can pilot some of these ideas and actually make some policy changes at the city. Because the city both Paris and Vancouver are part of the Rockefeller uh, Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program. And so we have a new chief resilience officer for two years funded by that program. So it's a huge opportunity 
to think differently about everything from the social side of resilience through to emergency management, through to our environmental issues around tsunami, uh, sea, wall, sea level change, all of the factors that uh, affect us from a resilience um, standpoint. Uh, oh yeah, so here's the knowledge mobilization, uh, the first report, and really, you know, it just opens up the, uh, the opportunity for us as a university to be much more connected and open and ready to receive questions from uh, our, our basic stakeholders and in some ways our funders. Uh, who pays my salary? Citizens pay my salary. So how do we make that connection? I have to say I was privileged and learned a lot for being in government for four years as a deputy minister. And I, I started to even more uh, be concerned about the gap between the capacity of gov government to have evidence-informed policy and our capacity to respond to that need. So that's why I'm excited about the knowledge mobilization opportunities and I think it's it's it comes down to always incentives like for example if you look at our faculty CVs Murdoch there's no place there for us to say what did we do in the knowledge mobilization arena so there's no reward for doing anything that might be perceived in, in that way so there's uh, there's certain changes that we can uh, that we can make so here's all the contact uh, info around should a cousin require information. We're, we just opened uh, our admissions for uh, this coming, for 2018. That's frightening, isn't it? Uh, so the first year we had 15 students. Uh, the second year, 25. This cohort, there's 41 students. And we've been attempting to have half domestic and half international. And this year we do more international than we do domestic. And interestingly enough, of that international cohort, oh, I think at least half are from Africa. So it's a hugely rich learning environment in terms of thinking about policy. Uh, and uh, half of those, again, come from this fantastic MasterCard Foundation African Leaders of Tomorrow program. And so we're really delighted by having that rich policy discussion around, well, this is how, this is how, these are the issues, this is how we tackle them uh, across, uh, across the globe. So, there we go. I have a couple more things. One of my, um, our communicate, you know, you must know Lindsay Marsh. So she said, now don't forget, Maura, to remind them about the LIND initiative. So we have this fantastic fund uh, that comes from a fellow by the name of Phil Lind, uh, made his money in Rogers Cable, and wanted to make sure that thought leaders from the United States could be available to students at UBC to learn from. So we've had, two years ago, we had Joseph Stiglitz, uh, and the, the theme was inequality. Last year, we had Rob Reich, uh, and this year we have uh, a whole, uh, an amazing lineup. So January 25th, Francis Tukuyama, the author, of, the author of a number of books, professor at Stanford. And we have Susan Rice coming. Uh, she's the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., former national security advisor to the Obama administration. These are top quality people. There's actually a class that runs through the spring where they get to actually interact with these folks. Uh, and so we have a number of other, uh, Stephen Pinker's coming, Anne-Marie Slaughter's coming. So if you go on the Policy School site, which maybe I should go back to, um, oops, you can, uh, you can find it. And then finally, I've had a lot of fun writing a book. I've had not a lot of fun writing a book for an academic publisher. <laughs> uh, so it's called Design Leadership, and it's published by um, Columbia University Press. And it's really about how, as a designer, I have a particular view of the world and a particular set of tech tools and techniques. 
And so I just, I wrote about how I used them uh, when I was dean, when I was deputy minister, and in my kind of day-to-day, -day, see, for me, all of you are leaders. And so when, when people say to me, so where, where might you find this book in a bookstore? I'm like, well, it is published by the Business School Press of Columbia, so it might find, initially, you might find it in the business section. And I'm kind of hoping it trickles down to be, you know, one of those books that, you know, anybody who's interested in kind of honing their leadership in their family, in their community, in this community, would be interested in.